Hey all, this is Not A Cat. How are ya? It's been a while, due to the fact that I had a novel to translate and uh, I got pregnant. Touch is life, right? And I have a feeling life is about to get a whole lot busier. So before Bambino gets here, I thought I'd take the time to give birth to another video essay as a little treat for you guys and also a treat for myself. Please let me know if you enjoyed watching this Twin Peaks video because putting it together has been one big delicious nostalgia trip for me and as such I enjoyed it quite a bit. Also don't forget to leave a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Now without further ado, let's get into it. It's been four years since I last delved into David Lynch's most widely loved creation. To this day I can vividly remember the fevered anticipation me and other fans felt in the run up to season 3, which was announced late 2014 I'm pretty sure. No other TV series seemed to be able to replicate the atmosphere Lynch had created all those years ago. Some can be described as breathing the same air, Jane Campion and Jared Lee's Top of the Lake for example, which I loved, but we were hungry for more. Aware that the new season would probably be filled with easter eggs I'd only be able to clock with a perfect memory of the show thus far, I started a rewatch around 2016. Or a binge, to be exact. It was like a warm hug, a coffee with an old friend, opening a box of memories that had been hidden under my bed for years just waiting to be rediscovered. Some episodes left me feeling unsettled, haunted or sad, but the arrival of Bad Lamenti's opening theme and the familiar woodland imagery at the start of every new episode always seemed to bring things back to earth. That opening was like the perfect remedy to whatever disturbing or surreal stuff was going on in the series. A pit stop, if you like, of peace. This applies mostly if you're binging one episode after the other, of course, but even if the series was made in the 90s and therefore not intended to be binged on streaming services, watching the opening again and again was not a problem for me. I never skipped it once. In fact, when talking with a friend about it at the time, we agreed it would be almost sacrilege to do so. Embarrassingly, I was part of not one but several Twin Peaks Facebook groups at the time, where I could see people of all ages were re-watching along with me. People who hadn't watched the series since it first came out in the 90s were revisiting it. Others were watching it for the first time after being intrigued by adverts for the return. And everyone was equally entranced and eager to share their fan theories. In fact, if you check out the comments section on the opening sequence on YouTube, you can really feel people's reverence for the show, especially in the comments from around the time everyone was re-watching in the lead up to the return. Twin Peaks's appeal is multifaceted. Some people feel particularly drawn to the esoteric or science fiction elements, continually finding new ways to interpret them. Some find the aesthetic very cozy and nostalgic, and some appreciate the emotional journey of the show or simply fell in love with the characters. But the opening is common ground in the sense that, from my experience at least, just about everyone can agree on its excellence. Just as almost everyone struggles to put their finger on exactly why the opening is excellent. But I'm going to have a crack at it today and try and figure out what makes this unforgettable sequence, arguably one of the most mysterious secrets to the show's success, so universally effective. I'll be discussing Lynch's direction, his use of colour, editing, symbolism, etc, and also Bad Lamenti's musical contribution. But let's start with where I'm most comfortable and get into the visuals. I want to go back to the quote from the start of the video for a second. In his book, Grey compares TV opening credits to several things, including the dimming of theatre lights or classical musicians tuning up their instruments. While a lot of modern shows take a more immediate res approach to starting episodes, I think that opening credits as a sort of ritualistic transition is the best way to do it. Gray actually mentions my favourite show, The Sopranos, and notes David Johansson's comment that Sopranos opening is like a road movie in miniature. This is food for thought because, for me, the opening credits of Twin Peaks are also kind of a journey, albeit a spectral one. Rather than a cocksure mob boss driving and smoking a cigar, filmed with a lot of jittery camera shake to convey this exciting yet precarious forward momentum, here in Twin Peaks it's like the viewer is a ghost floating through this midwestern world, simply observing. The camera is a lot steadier and largely static. When it does move, it floats rather than speeds ahead. Not to mention, again in contrast to the Sopranos credits, the languorous way in which the text drifts in and out of view in gentle fades. Thus the viewer is informed that this is a journey alright, with an important sense of locality and atmosphere, but it's not necessarily going to be a linear one, and it's not going to be fast either. Where The Sopranos says, get in the car, we've got a job to do, or get in the car, let's have some fun, the opening of Twin Peaks says, come have a seat and see where this leads us. Take a look at this funny little world with me. On that note, let's do a close analysis of the opening. The first thing we see is a thrush, 
a varied thrush to be exact, which might seem pretty innocuous, but is more than worthy of analysis in itself. Why is opening on the image of a bird important, you may ask? Well, birds are one of the most symbolically charged animals in art, and I'm sure that Lynch knows this. The owls in Twin Peaks, for example, house spirits or entities such as Bob, and in a broader sense, represent the unknown or the incomprehensible spiritual world. As Frank Boulez, I'm so sorry Frank, I cannot pronounce your second name. As Frank points out, birds have always been associated with the soul. Some birds are bad omens, crows and ravens for instance, but a little brown bird like this prints a positive, welcoming message in the viewer's mind. And when concentrated on as the focal point in an opening shot like this, its evocations of fresh country air and innocence are all the more powerful. It's not a strong bird, it's not an eagle, it's a little fragile thing. But it's allowed to be little and fragile, because this world we're being invited into is a safe place. Or at least that's what the bird suggests to me. It's interesting to note here that the bird isn't present in the opening for The Return, which isn't a huge surprise as Twin Peaks The Return so often feels like an exercise in warping, undermining, or discarding entirely a lot of the images which had become emblems of the series over the years. As Michael McGurk claims in this pretty interesting Medium article, which I'll link below, the disappearance of the varied thrush is a symbol of a decaying planet. I do actually think that there is an argument for this. I really don't want to spoil the return for anyone who hasn't seen it, but if you've experienced the apocalyptic fever dream that is episode 8, you'll know what I mean. That's where things really descend into what I'd call experimental cinema, and all structure is just broken down and annihilated. In fact, I'd love to write an essay about it one day. It's really great stuff. Anyway, McGurk's point is pretty astute as the thrush can very easily be seen as a symbol of the town's cozy outward appearance. The charming simplicity of places which seem less consumed with the damaging effects of modern industry. For an urban man like Cooper, this is one of Twin Peaks' biggest selling points. He falls in love with the trees, the local food, and finds it a welcome escape from big city life, as I'm sure a lot of the viewers do as well. And sure enough, along with the thrush, this small town charm is largely and deliberately missing from season 3. Onto editing, one of the first things one can notice in how this opening is put together is the repeated use of lap dissolves, like when the thrush dissolves into the mill. These types of dissolves create a nice pace and a mysterious atmosphere. Furthermore, they can also sometimes imply a relationship between two images. I believe Lynch is doing all three here. We have the thrush, a symbol of the fragility and peacefulness of nature, dissolving into the mill, a hint at human activity and industry. And from the mill we dissolve into a close-up of a saw blade cutting this big spiky cog. So you have this escalating sense of activity and danger and the unnatural, but it's done in such a subtle and gentle way. In an essay by Rachel Joseph, which you can find in this book, I found an interesting quote which states, Twin Peaks is an imaginary place where nature and civilization uneasily coexist. And we definitely feel this with the juxtaposition of the peaceful thrush and the intrusion of human activity. Particularly the saw blades connoting action, human progress, and yes, destruction. Saws cut down trees after all. And where do birds live? We rest on the saw shot for several protracted seconds, then get a different angle. That's when the writing appears, at least in the longer version of the credits. This is a big powerful moment which coincides with the climax of the musical theme's melody. We'll look into music in a bit, but that moment always gave me goosebumps, when the notes in Badalamenti's chords resolve in this sort of transcendent, angelic sigh of relief. It pairs strangely well with the typography too, which, despite the revisionary nature of season 3, was kept exactly the same for the return. This gives us a chance to talk about colour. The choice of neon green here successfully complements, albeit strangely, all the earth tones in this opening sequence. The earth tones which are such a recurring visual signature of the series itself and its Midwest setting. Importantly though, it also feels distinctly alien. I mean, it's the colour of uranium, for God's sake. Green is the colour of nature, sure, but this is a poisonous green, a dangerous green. This incongruous juxtaposition of colours with contrasting moods creates a nice Lynchian tension which sets the viewer up for a relaxing country excursion, but with the suggestion of the surreal or the scary. Specifically, I always thought the typography felt suggestive of science fiction, which would be appropriate, but maybe that's just me. Back to the dissolves, we slowly drift into a lingering static shot of the Welcome to Twin Peaks sign, where we get an idea of the area's smallish population. But still, there's no people. Just the promise of people, reduced to numbers on a board. 
I find this creates a feeling of emotional distance, while others might find the image of the sign simply wholesome and comforting. Either way, you can't deny that there is something kind of lonely about this image as a whole. As the camera lingers, the viewer's eyes drift inevitably to the mountains behind, which are enormous. The vast, imposing geometry of the place gives us the impression that this area is well and truly cut off from the rest of the world. There is not a single person in the frame, in the entire opening sequence, in fact. Which is an interesting decision, considering that Twin Peaks is very much a show about people and the relationships that they have with one another. Anyway, after this we have a shot of a waterfall, filmed in slow motion. Which brings me back to that idea of the tension between contrasting moods. This is a fairly relaxing image, but nevertheless the rushing water connotes a certain danger and wildness. The unpredictability of what you might find if you step out from the porch of your small town home. The atmosphere is relaxing, but also mournful as we then float along the river. It's as though the viewer is sitting on a little boat, just drifting along and contemplating. If you know anything about Lynch's hobbies, you'll know he's big into meditation. And I find the use of water in this opening decidedly meditative. In the shorter version of the opening, there is no writing until we get to the sign 30 seconds in. And in the longer version, we have to wait 40 whole seconds. This is a difference of just 10 seconds, but in film and TV time, this is a long time and provides a more contemplative experience. However, I'd argue that both openings give us ample time to contemplate the sequence's individual elements, one of these being the playful sparks of the saw blades. A spark from a saw might not seem like much, but Lynch manages to make it somewhat cinematic, pretty even. I think this is partly because the machines seem to be moving sort of in time with the music. Not literally on the beat, because that would be kind of janky and almost comedic, but at the same speed, if you know what I mean. Interestingly, there are no trees being sliced into here, even though tree cutting is what happens at sawmills. Now, I don't pretend to know anything about the milling industry, but they seem to be sharpening the blades. So we have this beautiful legato score with these pretty sparks, contemplative lingering close-ups, and the dreamy up and down movement of the machinery, but also the subtext of this being a machine of destruction we're seeing. It's that contrast we see so often in Twin Peaks between the simple beauty in life and the ugliness, the danger which exists alongside it. The danger which is intrinsic in human existence, in fact. Indeed, Twin Peaks touches very frequently on the idea of good and evil, even exploring the idea of physical spaces which house good and evil spirits. The woods and trees in general are intrinsic to this stuff in Twin Peaks, having a sort of eerie magical quality as well as providing their cozy setting. Trees are all over the intro, even reflected in the water in that ghostly extended tracking shot that I talked about earlier. One of the classic Twin Peaks lines which sticks in the mind long after hearing it is one who chants out between two worlds. Depending on who you ask, it's chance, not chants, but that's beside the point here. The point is the existence of these two worlds, which can be interpreted as the real world and the spirit world, the natural world and the supernatural world, or the realm of good and the realm of evil, or even the realm of your waking life and the realm of your dreams. Whatever way you look at it, the forest is a special liminal space where these two worlds meet, not only in Twin Peaks, but in literature and film in general. If you were ever forced to study Shakespeare's A Midsummer Night's Dream in school, you're probably familiar with this concept. Indeed, as Martha Nachimson indicates, Lynch sees the whole opening as an enigmatic interpretation of opposites, and this is more than evident in the smooth, soft editing techniques combined with what she calls sharp images. Moreover, Nachimson also notes the use of Angelo Badalamenti's music, and I would be doing the series a great disservice if I didn't do the same. The piece that plays in the opening to Twin Peaks is an instrumental version of Julie Cruz's Falling, composed by a New York-born composer, Angelo Badalamenti. Notably, this opening track was kept the same for The Return, a successful move that people seemed to really like. Even if the imagery was a bit different, the presence of this music seemed to anchor the opening of the new season in the familiar just the right amount. Which says a lot, I think, about just how great a part the intro music played in helping the series stick in people's minds for all those years. The opening musical motif is an unforgettable piece of synth magic. People were so intrigued by it, in fact, that Lynch and Badalamenti decided not to tell anyone the exact source of the sound, only revealing how they'd done it years later. It's twangy, yet rich, it's understated, yet dramatic, and it sets the stage for all the sweeping legato string sounds which contribute so much to the floaty feeling of the opening. 
Now, musical theory is not my forte. In fact, my complete inability to understand it or study it put me off doing a singing degree, so I can't talk about the music in depth the way I can about the visuals. I can only really tell you how it makes me feel, and Angelo's composition makes me feel weightless, welcomed, and ever so slightly uneasy. Now, was this music written for Twin Peaks, like Audrey's dance or Laura's theme? And was it created solely by Badalamenti? Not exactly. Before a single note was composed, Lynch wrote the lyrics for this song himself, being the author that he is, in turn inspiring what we hear in the opening. But the song was originally written for Cruz's debut album, and it wasn't until about a year later that Lynch decided to use the instrumental version for the series. Angelo described this surprise as a dream come true, and if you want to know more about all that, check out this article from Vulture.com, as it's a great read. Also, side note, if you haven't seen this video of Badalamenti discussing how he and Lynch created Laura's theme, go watch that right now. It gives you a great idea of the special working relationship these two men had, and it really highlights how the soundtrack is very much their baby that they made together, rather than something created by just one or the other. Nevertheless, it was Lynch's words which originally sparked Badalamenti's musical ideas. Now, this isn't Lynch's only successful attempt at songwriting. Far from it, in fact. Take the ballad Mysteries of Love from Blue Velvet, for example, a film which is like a masterclass in how to make a disturbing movie all the more haunting through the inclusion of dreamy, romantic musical numbers. I'd argue that the song he did with Likey Lee is also fairly good. It's very Lynchian in that it's hypnotic and its simplicity and sort of haunting. That song was actually from his third studio album, so I'm sure he has a lot more songs than that. But I, uh, I must confess that I have not looked into David Lynch's music career very deeply. If he ever does a classic R&B album though, I'll be right there. Lynch doesn't write complicated songs by any means. Some people think that the lyrics are garbage, actually, but I think pop lyrics make sense with Lynch's love of melodrama and romance. I mean, Twin Peaks feels distinctly like a soap opera at times, and that's very deliberate. Even with the saccharine lyrics taken out for the show's opening, Falling is an unabashedly emotive song, and you can hear where the lyric Falling goes in the song if you listen to Badalamenti's descending notes, where it goes... Very nice stuff. It gives you that feeling of falling, i.e. of falling in love, without necessarily needing any lyrics at all. And it's filled with what Clarini Nonarelli calls Lynchian innocence. I mentioned that a lot of the appeal of Twin Peaks is how it balances the sweet and the sinister, and Angelo's interpretation of Lynch's lyrics does just that. Here's a pertinent quote from Rachel Zafirai found in a 2017 Guardian article by Dorian Linsky. Zafira argues that the effect of the opening theme has an even longer lasting impact and is even better to revisit than the show itself. You could put that opening theme into a really bland piece of footage, she says, and that footage is suddenly going to feel more meaningful. How many times can you watch the show from start to finish? Music lasts longer. Zafira may or may not be suggesting here that the imagery in the opening is in fact a little bland, or at least would lack a lot of its impact without being combined with sound. If that is what she's saying, she might be onto something, and that's not a critique of Lynch. Film is, at its essence, a controlled combination of sound and image. Even silent cinema had sound in the form of live music. The opening, however elegant and mysterious, is a little flat without the music, and that's okay. I don't want to detract from her main point here, however, which is that the music often sticks in your head so much more firmly than the show itself. By that same token, the intro might stick a lot more in your head than the show itself, and there's not a lot of shows that you can say that about. I like to think that this magically ambiguous and timeless intro, paired so beautifully with Badalamenti's music, was perhaps the secret ingredient that kept Twin Peaks fans entranced for those 16 years between season 2 and season 3. Instead of reminiscing a particular scene or episode, all they had to do was hear those first few notes in their mind, or picture the little bird on his branch, and they'd find themselves immediately transported back to the dreamy feeling the show instilled in them all those years ago. And that, I think, is a good place to wrap things up. <laughs> because I think I've said pretty much all I had to say, and also because I'm feeling very pregnant and would quite like to lie down now. <laughs> this was my attempt at a shorter video, I promise. I won't know if I've achieved that until I go to start editing, but one can hope. I don't know if I made many novel points here, or if it can even be described as much of a video essay, so consider it a love letter. Because I love Twin Peaks. 
And sometimes loving a show is a lot like loving a person. You can talk all you want about specifics, you can make a comprehensive list of all the things you like about them, but at the end of the day, the feeling you get from it is bigger than your words, and bigger than any combination of describable objects. It just is.